All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is Crazy Damn Canadians, episode number 33, and I can already guarantee this is going to be my favorite episode, uh, because I think out of all the things that we have discussed, this will be one of the most important, uh, at least in my humble opinion, and the reason is because uh, my guest today is Rochelle Mazur, who I have known since grade eight uh, in Kelly Road Secondary, which constantly gets referenced in this podcast. Um, we just seem to find a lot of guests from there. Um, but Rochelle is the head respiratory therapist at UNBC. And uh, Rochelle, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So we have an objective today to discuss some of the things you've experienced uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, but before we get into that, I thought we'd set a baseline and show that you're not entirely a crazy person but that you are uh -oh. <laughs> somewhat grounded <laughs> in reality. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> so first, can you tell us a little bit about where are you from? I know you went to Kelly Road and that's it about your childhood. So what was your childhood in Prince George? Um, so I was actually born in Smithers, but I was raised mostly here. I lived in the Chief Lake area. So way, way out, very long bus ride. Um, and I went to high school. I went to elementary at Nuka Lake and I went to high school at Kelly Road. Okay. And parents are both still in Prince George? and They are. They are. Okay. Still live outside of town? Nope. They both live in town. Oh, because one of the things that's notable about you is you are a massive outdoors I'd almost say freakishly outdoors human. Mm -hmm. Everything you do, you see, is these wild adventures. So tell us a little bit about some of the things that you do. Um, I kind of have a policy of trying to say yes to everything. Um, I found that my greatest adventures in life come by just throwing caution to the wind and trying it. So uh, being a country girl, I found that I don't really do very well inside. So when I say yes to things, it's always outside. Um, I love to hike, I love to run, um, whitewater stand up paddle boarding, backcountry sledding, um, dabbled in hockey. Oh Lord, what else? Dirt biking, mountain biking. Um, yeah, I don't know. And so about half those activities are not something that typically you see women in, at least mm -hmm. historically you didn't. Uh, more recently, you're one of the first people, one of the first, I would say, like ladies that formed a huge surge in women's sledding in Prince George, and you were part of that. You guys even had a name. What was it? The, uh, the Betty's Power Sport Network. Yeah, yeah, let's see. We got a picture uh -oh. of you on your sled, and uh, for people at home this is how Rochelle sled <gasps> oh Jesus <laughs> <laughs> oh that's not how I sled um, that was actually a <laughs> picture done um, down in Washington and it was done as a fundraiser so yeah. um, the money from the calendar that was made went towards efforts for conserving the backcountry oh that's yeah. wild yeah so how long did you sled for and you don't have to leave that up, that'll be too distracting. Uh, I think I started in 2008 and um, it kind of exploded for me. I went to a sled show and I was looking at a calendar and it had this awesome picture of a guy and he was doing something spectacular on a cliff and I was like, well, that would be a great photo if it was in focus. And this huge man turns around, he's like six foot four with this really deep voice and he goes, you think you could do a better job? And I said, well, yeah, because I, I did a lot of photography, professional photography, and he goes, but like, can you fly in a helicopter? And I'm like, well, yeah, because <laughs> I flew um, Stars Transport, working one of my jobs in Alberta, so I knew I could fly in a helicopter, and he was like, hey, you're hired. And uh, it was thunderstruck, and it was Jim Phelan. Oh, no way. Yeah, so uh, next thing I know, I'm like, headed out into the backcountry with probably some of the country's craziest riders. Um, and I was the only girl. <laughs> and for people to understand, Thunderstruck is like the premier sledding video organization. Mm -hmm. If you sled, you know what this is, yeah. and it would yeah. be a dream to get that chance. And you yeah. got it by being lippy accidentally yeah. at yeah. a sled show. Yeah. I did not know that. that and is then, so cool. like, next thing I know, I'm hanging out of a helicopter watching some guy make a world record climb on his sled. Like, it was insane. And 
I was probably one of the first women in the industry that could at least half keep up. Um, some of the smarter people in the industry, Terry from TNT Power Sports in Bonneville, Alberta, recognized that women are the untapped portion of the market. And he was like, throw your support there. So there were six of us. We had sponsored sleds. We went all over the country, um, basically just teaching other women how to sled. We made movies um, that were purely women. And we weren't doing anything really crazy, but no one had ever seen a, a film with just women. And so fast forward a couple of years later at the Edmonton Slideshow, we were premiering our movie. And we actually sold out our premiere on the same night that 509, one of the biggest sledding movies in the industry, was also premiering and everyone was at ours because it had <laughs> never been done before. Um, and it was all just kind of like this series of happy accidents and you just keep going. Yeah. That is awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I know recently also I saw that you sold your sled so you're leaving and mm -hmm. what would you attribute that to? What was that decision for? Because some of your friends are gonna watch this and I know that wasn't really clear to me. Why did you decide to do it? Um, lots of things. Part of it is just COVID. We've been quarantined for so long that the last time I used my sled was February of 2020. Um, my kids are getting older. The prescribed amount of time that kids are at home is sort of drawing to a close for me. Um, my youngest turned 16 yesterday, so technically I'm on borrowed time with my 18 and 23 year old and they want to ski. So if that's what they want to do, that's what mom's going to do. Fair, mm -hmm. and that's a good decision. You can always pick it back up later mm -hmm. too, right? Mm -hmm. So did you always maintain an active lifestyle? Um, yeah, I have three brothers and uh, so, I mean, I can't remember a day when we weren't just kicked outside. <laughs> yeah. And if you want to have anything to do, you hang out with the boys, right? I think that was all of our life, especially yeah. when we lived in the heart. Yep. Um, it was a really outdoor based kind of lifestyle. It, was, it wasn't was deemed to be scary if your parents kicked you out. You just disappeared and it yeah, was fine. Yeah, no, it was come back at dinner time. Yeah. yeah. So how did you end up get, becoming a respiratory therapist? And I got lectured when I, I call you a nurse. I'm like, my friend Rochelle is a nurse. And then I'm like, no, <laughs> respiratory therapist. And I'm like, okay, what's the difference? Um, the difference is, Okay, the, if you asked us and we were being flippant, we would say the difference is we don't wipe bums uh, or <laughs> <laughs> we only deal from here up. Um, but the difference is we, we deal primarily with breathing. So, um, and where nurses typically have like an assigned patient load, we're all over the hospital. So what did it look like? What was your job like previous to 2020? Describe what a day was like going to work. Um, so respiratory therapists that work in acute care inside of the hospital, we're kind of on an on-call basis. It's like being the ambulance of the hospital. So there's only usually three or four of us on shift at any given time. And we just answer stack calls and see the sickest patients. So if someone is having a cardiac arrest, we're doing CPR. If someone has a massive car accident, we're in the trauma bay, we're at the head of the bed and we're in charge of all the airway and breathing. So we'll capture the airway and we will breathe for them using the ventilator. If a baby is being premature or is a high risk delivery, we're at the head of the bed at that delivery and we're just wherever we, needed it, we are needed at any given time. And how busy was it? Like was the job on a scale of one to 10 kind of what, I wanna get a baseline okay. of how stressful it was doing the job how did you feel about it? So first, how stressful was the job previous to March 2020? Uh, it's, it was feast or famine. So when you're busy, you're busy. And so I would say like, if you averaged it out, I'd give it a six or seven out of 10. Like they're life-threatening situations, but there would be times when it's super busy for a full shift and then not very busy the next shift, right? So you kind of got a break, you got to breathe. Right. Mm -hmm. So when the pandemic first hit, um, a lot of stuff was said mm -hmm. and part of the purpose in talking to you is people don't believe the media mm -hmm. I think we have a, I mean and honestly in a lot of cases you can't believe the media now it, right. I don't even disagree I'm not a yeah. conspiracy theorist by any means but actually I do genuinely believe there's a disconnect or you can tilt the truth right 
And that was the accusation that was made. Like it, even if I came forward and said, look, I have a friend and I talked to her and I know that the hospital's really busy and they're stressed out. We need to be more compassionate. People would say that's secondhand information now because it goes through a single person. Right. So March 2020, what was it like then? Not what did it get like, just what was it like when COVID broke out and everybody started panicking and saying the hospital's in trouble? Was it bad here? What was it like? Um, no, it wasn't that bad. Not for most people. I'll, I'll be honest, I, I was like, this will blow over. I, um, I've been through four kind of global pandemic, endemic preparation for the worst. I, I've been through SARS. Um, H1N1 was a really bad one. We prepared for Ebola. Um, so this was the fourth one and I was like, <laughs> Uh, you know, the, the worst that might happen is I don't get to see my eyelash technician for a couple of weeks and I'm not going to be quite as pretty, you know, so maybe I'll learn how to put my own eyelashes on. Like, honestly, I wasn't taking it seriously either. Everything else we had experienced before was a glancing blow. And so it was busy for the hospitals in terms of preparing for what might happen. And that's really a hard thing to do because no one's seen it before. So. We have what we think is an airborne disease and we don't really know how it's transmitted, but we need to change all of our procedures. So there was a lot of like, what's happening in Italy? What's happening in New York? Okay, yeah. how do we prepare for that? You know, like we would, we would do these, run these constant code scenarios where we were all in our PPE and nobody entered the room until everybody was totally ready. And there was a special team and, um, you know, they were trialing these boxes where you intubate inside the box. Because when you put a breathing tube inside somebody, you're like literally feet away from them. And all of that super contagious stuff is coming straight at your face. So we were preparing for how to keep ourselves safe. So there was a lot of practicing, there was a lot of contingency plans, there was a lot of where do we get equipment from, and just a lot of information translation. We had a special airway team, um, all the anesthesiologists were on it, and two RTs, myself and Brad, and we were on call for like three months straight. And, um, you know, I was busy because I would be on call in the middle of the night and then up in the morning. But volume wise, you know, compared to what we saw in the later phases, we weren't busy at all, you know. But what would you say your stress level was at that time then? You were, if you were a five, six before mm -hmm. that or five to seven, mm -hmm. when, when, when it hit, you weren't busy, but yep. what was your stress level like? What was happening internally then? Uh, for me, I have a staff of 26 people and not knowing what was going to happen and being the chief of respiratory, everybody's looking at me to know the answers and in reality, the answers were changing every day and I felt the weight of leadership and keeping people safe and knowing answers. So for me, I think we turned up the heat probably to like an eight. But, and actually that's a good point though, when you say the answers were changing every day, because that is the most common reason to deny everything. Right. The most common thing mm -hmm. people say is, well, you said this yesterday mm -hmm. and now it's this today, so it's all BS. Right. Speak to that. What, what would you say to that if someone said that to you? How many of us in our personal lives don't know what we don't know and fumble into something and make a mistake and have to correct? and? and direct the course in a different direction. Like we're looking at humans trying to predict something that's never been seen before. Of course there's gonna be mistakes. Of course there's going to be oversight and we're not gonna be prepared in certain areas and we're gonna be overprepared in others. Like I don't know how it could have been done differently. One of the biggest complaints, one of the biggest arguments where people got really upset, where you saw people extremely emotional was the fact that we had to isolate people because we didn't know. Right. Speak to that a little bit. What was that like? <laughs> and I know this is gonna be hard, but mm -hmm. as a respiratory therapist, seeing somebody when they did come in, but when did we start getting patients? Like, and how many would you say, what was the first wave that you would say impacted us, if you can remember? I'd say we got a tiny wave in the beginning of like May, June. So it happened actually pretty early. Like we started seeing COVID patients trickle in early that spring after the March 2020. Um, 
And that first wave was pretty onerous in that the rules were like this. And if a patient was on 10 liters oxygen, which is not really all that much, it was like, you don't mess around, you intubate right now. Um, and so we were intubating early. They were all of a sudden on life support. Um, so that would be the first, the first part of the pandemic. And then as the pandemic evolved, we learned that we could have patients come in and we actually didn't want to intubate them early. We wanted to use lots of other interventions first and keep that intubation as the last thing in our, in our pocket. So um, it was busy in that we were just kind of, we were doing what the rest of the world was doing. Like it was best practice. That was everything that was coming out from therapeutics committees. It was the best knowledge that we had, but it definitely was, was gonna change. So it was busy in the aspect that we didn't, we didn't totally have a roadmap. Yeah, and I mean, that's understandable. Mm -hmm. I mean, from the perspective of anybody hearing, oh my God, I wonder, because we didn't have that knowledge, it'd be easy to cast blame, but you don't know what you don't know. And unfortunately, it's trial by fire. You yeah. literally have to experiment yeah. to come up with the answers. But that would be heartbreaking, realizing later, I wonder how many people we lost because we don't have the answers or how many people were adversely affected. And I can only imagine. So what was the impact on the people in the hospital when someone came in and they couldn't see their family? What would, how difficult was that for the people that you worked around, would you say? Did they adapt around it or? Um, in some ways it took some of the burden off the healthcare givers because we do spend a lot of time working on family and patient-centered care. I mean, that's the ideal goal, is that you provide this holistic model of care that involves the family along the journey so that they understand everything that's happened and so that they can be an advocate for the wishes of their loved one and so that the, the loved mm. one themselves can speak and be understood, you know? So, um, but that takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. So in some ways, while we were tra trying to navigate these new pathways and, and learn about the disease itself, it was actually a relief. But on the other hand, emotionally, as you got to the part where people were sicker and sicker, it really prevents a barrier um, because it's hard to tell loved ones, you know, they're not doing very well because they can't picture that. They don't know what that means. So we think we've been giving like this roadmap all along where the family understands that their loved one might not make it and yet they've never laid eyes on their loved one and when it mm. comes time to have that conversation about we've run out of options you know it's it's time to think about saying goodbye they're shocked there's a disconnect because they haven't seen it yeah. yeah, you know, and people that are about to be intubated and put on life support and they don't know if they're coming off, they don't get to see anybody. Yeah, that is not the answer I expected, actually. That's yeah. funny. I never thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. In all the conversations I've had with different people in the hospital, yeah. that perspective, huh? Interesting. Yeah. So can you give me, like, what would you say are some of the, like, give us an example of some of the more inspiring things, or do you have an example, or can you think of something that happened or occurred, or anyone that you would give recognition to, or a situation? Oh man, um, you know, one thing about kind of being in the trenches all the time is that you really look for like these glimpses of hope, and there were so many along the way. Um, yeah, I can't even talk about them without like getting emotional, but. I remember the first time I looked out the window and saw the parades at seven o'clock and you know you're just head down and ass up all day long and then you look out and you see all these people that are cheering you on like that was the first sign that there was life beyond that what we were doing was worth it um, you know uh, staff members their their families sending us us meals my, my parents furnished meals for all of ICU HAU and that was early on and it was just like a really big surprise, but it was an even bigger surprise when it would happen months down the road. And we were like, wow, we haven't been forgotten. You know, like um, gift certificates from Westwood Pub, 
um, yeah. you know, you and, and just private individuals making meals for us and bringing us like real food um, that didn't come out of a wrapper where it was just crazy amazing. You know, but it was also like little things like the healthcare team pulling together. Like you could always hear a bit of laughter ring out. I, I would be walking through the halls up on surgery, hauling all my bronchoscopy equipment and my great big respirator on and I'm sweating and I can hardly breathe because I'm running the stairs with all this stuff, you know, and I, I heard Josh Staub, one of, one of the LPNs yell out, you know, like, we love our RTs, you know, and just from down the hallway and you're just like, that, that means everything. Like you look for all those little signs of, signs of life, really. Yeah. One of the popular things um, that was stated was that we lost 20%, 50%, depends on who you're talking to, mm -hmm. of our RTs and our, you know, the, the, the nurses. Can you speak to that a little bit? When we went through this, who have we lost? How many people have we lost? Where are we sitting at right now? Um, I, don't, I don't actually know numbers. The RT department itself is always traditionally understaffed in any hospital, in any health authority. So we were definitely at a disadvantage going in. Um, we haven't experienced it, you know, any more hardship than places in Alberta or Fraser Health in terms of trying to just keep up with the workload and the, the minimal numbers. Uh, but the nurses, they've definitely, they've definitely migrated, probably because they have more more positions to move into. Like when you're an RT, there's not a lot that you can do outside of the hospital as an RT. Um, so there's nowhere to go, even if you wanted to go. There, there's probably nowhere to go. You need a career change if you right, want to leave. Right, um, but for the nurses, there's, there's lots to do. There's lots of other places where you can just go find that breather. And, and lots did, you know. The, it got to the point where you, you just, you've seen enough, um, you've worked enough, and you're just kind of done. And we've lost a lot of really good nurses um, just to burnout. Really? So yeah. I, I guess, you know, we all have the same hope that it ends and people can come back, that they're just taking a break because mm -hmm. I think it'll be a long-term effect on our healthcare system if they don't. Yeah. Um, how about you? How, how is your mental health gone through this? How, and I know, I know that answer, but <laughs> we're going to talk about it. How big of a struggle was it for you? Um, it's been pretty tough. Yeah. Uh, the first time I got a haircut, I cried. Um, yeah. Just because it was the first time I actually felt like me in two years. Um, I don't look in the mirror, I just feel tired, so I don't, I don't want to see the tired face in the mirror. Um, you know, so that's not the same person that went into the pandemic, for sure. I think that I'm really lucky. I had super good coping mechanisms going in, you know, like I have a pretty good mindfulness program. I know how to get out onto a trail and run out every last frustration and you know I can't tell you how many 14 kilometer runs I bawled all the way through them until it was just gone um, yeah it's it's been rough you know like I've watched my own family get COVID and get intubated and get put on life support and uh, those are dark days I didn't know that actually yeah yeah um, yeah, it's been tough. Out of all the people who stepped up to help, mm -hmm. could you say like a couple of the top ones that you would like to give recognition to? What, what are the most powerful? I know you mentioned the um, parades. Mm -hmm. What else would you say is notable that people should know about that they might not have known that we can just say good for you, recognition to those humans? Well, you're not going to love this answer, but you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and... I didn't know you were going to ask that question, so I, it's not a self-serving question at all, so you can hear your name. Like, I absolutely not, but I can't tell you how many times my phone rang and you're just like, Rochelle, what's going okay. on there? What do you guys need? What can I bring you? You know, and it wasn't just like a one-time thing, it was continual. 
Okay, but I, okay, thank you. I appreciate that. I read a book recently and it mm -hmm. had a chapter in it saying when people give you a compliment, don't be disingenuous and deny it. Right. It's an insult to the person giving it. Yeah. So now I catch myself and I'm like, thank, thank you. It's hard though, right? Yeah, yeah. well, and I, to be fair, mm -hmm. um, that's a very, I have a lot of friends who are nurses. It's like, a, I don't know what it is, but it's like all the people who want to be friends with me recently <laughs> <laughs> all seem to be nurses. So that's my whole network. I walk into the, I walk into ICU and it's like five of the eight people are giving yeah. me a hug, Dave! Yeah, so, Dave, and I've yeah. known them all previous. Yeah. It's, yeah, I, I guess I'm a nurse magnet, but none of them want to date me, so. <laughs> 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 just, just friends. <laughs> uh, this is a tougher question. Okay. Because um, it's kind of political, but um, what was it like witnessing people lose their jobs when the vaccine mandate came in, in the hospital? What were your feelings on that? Oh, oh. I have a lot of redheaded feelings. Um, I spend a lot of time trying to step out of my big redheaded feelings and really drill down a bit. And so it's hard for me to understand. It's hard for me to understand the hesitancy to get vaccinated when I know unequivocally that the proof is there. And it's really easy to be angry at a collective that won't get vaccinated. But when you meet the actual people and you hear their fears and you hear yeah. the things that they have heard on social media, you know, it's hard to blame them. They don't get to see what I see. They don't, they don't know how serious it can be. You know, when my family member was, was struggling and really fighting for his own health, um, and I, I have permission to share this story and I won't share his name, one of, one of the things that he said to me is like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I didn't get vaccinated. You know, he said, I'm, I'm just a simple person and all I see is what's on social media. And he was bawling when he said this to me, between breaths. Um, you know, he said, I only see what I, what I see on social media and the vaccine's scary and the neighbor got clots and that neighbor dropped dead of a, of a heart attack and, you know, COVID's got like a 2% death rate. He said, I'm healthy. I've never been in the hospital before. Of course I was gonna play those odds. But he said, you know, like if I had known, if I had known that this is what it would be like, yeah. I, I would have been vaccinated. Like, can I get vaccinated now? Did he make it? He did, he did. But you know, I talked to him on the phone today and um, yesterday was the first day he got to stand to take a shower. In how long? Uh, well, he went on life support before Christmas. Oh. Yeah. And he is out of the hospital, but he didn't get discharged without oxygen. He does not have the use of his right leg. He's going blind. Uh, he's only a couple of years older than I am, you know, and I think that's, that's what people don't understand. And, and you know, I said, if, if you could have people understand one thing, coming out of this, what would it be? And he said, COVID's scary, but long COVID is even scarier. He said, there's nothing really in place because no one really knows what long COVID's gonna be. There's no rehab for us. Yeah. There's no real follow-up in place yet. They don't know if this blindness that I'm experiencing is gonna be partial, like just stop. Is it gonna progress? Will, will it clear up and go away? You know, he said, I'm in constant pain. I don't know if I'm going to live like that for the rest of my life. Yeah. Um, so people losing their jobs in healthcare kind of astounds me. You know, getting back to your original question, it astounds me because when we go into healthcare, we don't get to go into our jobs or even into practicums as students without vaccinations. We have to have proof of all sorts of vaccinations and it's because of the pub public health model that we protect our patients um, and that we have an understanding that that's part of protecting our patients. So it's really hard for me to understand healthcare workers not getting vaccinated. I personally don't know anyone who lost their job because they, were re they had refused to take the vaccine. So I haven't personally had that experience, but I do know lots of nurses that have lost their mental health 
because of COVID and the fact that this just keeps going on and on and on. Um, and I'm not blaming that on the people that aren't vaccinated. I'm, I'm just saying like, I just don't have a perspective where I can get behind feeling really, really bad for people that lose their jobs because at this point, I'm on the side where I feel really, really bad for people that have lost themselves and that are emotionally devastated over giving like literal pieces of themselves every day, day and night for more than two years. I'm gonna play devil's advocate and yeah. take the other side now. Sure. And I'm gonna show how easy it is to take someone, I support vaccines, mm -hmm. um, I take vaccines I don't need. Yeah. I'm just one of those people who's like, I go in and get checked what vaccines don't I have right. and then take them. So I've always been a believer in science. Right. Having said that, I still don't like being told I have to. Mm -hmm. Ironically, I'll volunteer to. So I can understand a little bit, but here's when I publicly promoted and supported follow the guidelines, listen to Bonnie Henry, do what we need to do, pull together, that's how we get through this, right up until the day that they closed the gyms. Right. And the moment they said I could go to the pub, th there's a funny meme, I can go to the government-sponsored pot store, mm -hmm. get some weed, go to the liquor store, get some liquor, go to Costco, buy a bunch of junk food, go to the pub, get drunk with my friends, and then go home. Mm -hmm but I couldn't go to the gym, I damn near lost my mind. I yeah. publicly said I'm done and lost my mind. How did you react? Um, you know, this is 100% my own opinion, but I think this is where we started losing traction. Uh, some, of, some of the stuff just doesn't make sense. And I don't even go to the gym. Like I have faithfully worked out for more than two years every single day at home. So the gym is not like a huge facet of my life, but when I heard the gym mandates, I was like, how does that make sense? For some people, that is literally the only thing keeping them sober. That's literally their lifeline. So I can, I can say that I, I get some of the disconnect. I absolutely do. On a larger scale though, when people are told that they have to have something, it's mandated. It is mandated to go to a certain place, but they still have choice. They still, they have chosen to not take the vaccine. There's no jail, there's no fine. They can still freely move among society. You just can't choose to endanger patients by working in a healthcare setting. You know, yeah. you can't go into a restaurant and sit down, but you can still order out from a restaurant. And maybe I'm jaded because I've been to third world countries where they know what freedom is. You know, they have literally stood in bread lines because their governments have, have sold every edible product from the country and exported it away from their people. 12 year olds standing in bread lines at 3 a.m. for food for their siblings because their parents had been conscripted to the government's army. You know, where the cell phone is so sacred among their population that they all have one and they use it at will, no matter what's happening. If you're in the middle of a city hall ceremony, you pick up that darn cell phone because the government had oppressed them so badly that everybody that had a landline was afraid to use it because the government was listening. You know, I've been to places where they actually are completely corrupt and oppressive. So to me, the inability to sit down at a restaurant, I don't know, like, I'm just not buying it. I, I don't think people have truly lost their freedom. I think they've lost some first world privileges, but in general, most of us, you know? I didn't need restaurants this summer, I camped. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Isn't that a fantastic thing for all the negativity and it has been negative. Mm -hmm. There's no mm -hmm. but. The connection to nature has completely changed with a significant portion of our population. More people hiking, climbing mountains. Okay, so like, can I be totally selfish? I know you don't like it. <laughs> Why are there so many people in my space? <laughs> Go back home and quit buying all the equipment. <laughs> I know. You couldn't get snowshoes last year? I know. $500 I paid for a pair of snowshoes. But like, first world problem. I know, at least like, I can afford $500 really? for a pair of snowshoes. There's actually countries that can't even choose vaccines 
because they can't afford it. You live in a country where your health care is provided for you, and that vaccine is free, whether you choose to take it or not. Yeah. First world problems. But yeah, nature, absolutely. And drilling down and getting back to like the simple things and spending time with our families and getting rid of all these schedules for kids and just like opening things up in terms of the time and the quality that we spend with loved ones and appreciating them when we do get the chance to see them again. Like, if there is a silver lining, that's got to be it. Yeah, and I totally agree with you. Yeah. I'm going to stick that as my silver lining. Yeah. So, we've had Delta, Omicron, next we'll have Betacon or whatever it'll be. <laughs> what do you see happening? Oh, gosh. Can I just, like, have a out-of-this-world wish that may or may not be realistic? I'm not a virologist or an epidemiologist of any sort, but like we, we've seen Omicron change. I think it deleted like 54 or 56 antigens from its surface. Like that's, that's a pretty big evolution. And it seems to have gotten weaker. Like the numbers are telling us people are getting sick in numbers we don't even know because we can't test them all. Yeah. Um, but we're not seeing that translate into severe illness and hospitalizations the way that we did with Delta, especially Delta. Delta was a killer, literally. Um, so, you know, once upon a time, SARS, which is also a coronavirus from way back 2003 era, I think, it, it like replicated itself out of like existence. So maybe, maybe we're seeing the late phase of when this particular coronavirus is just gonna kinda unalive itself. <laughs> Oh, no, I sure hope so. Um, you know, and like with, with a lot of people that aren't vaccinated, getting Omicron and getting like not so severe illness, maybe that's our natural immunity where we, we all... A lot I of people know. question then, I why aren't know. we opening up now? Like, why aren't they just saying, okay, let's let it go. It's been two years. Everybody's saying we don't, aren't seeing the severe illness. I guess it's an abundance of caution. If you open it back up, then you have to lock back down. Because it doesn't take very much to overwhelm an ICU. That's why. Because of every subset of patients that get Omicron or Delta or whatever it might be, what, whatever variant, a certain percentage of them are going to end up in our ICUs. And if you just open it up wide, our hospitals are overwhelmed again. How long can we delay necessary surgeries and put off all yeah. sorts of things for other people, right? You know, it's not just about COVID. It's, it's about people that are waiting for really necessary procedures that have been put on the back burner. One of my friends, she's an older lady, 71 years old. I hang out with her every couple of weeks. We have dinner together. And mm -hmm. Several months ago, she told me they found a black spot in her lung and mm -hmm. she needs to get an MRI. Mm -hmm. A black spot in her lung and two months later, she still hasn't been able to get it. Yeah. That's the problem with... Yeah. Yeah. backing stuff up so um, two more questions um, how important do you think it is for people to get vaccinated now the, the data shows us inconclusively that even if it doesn't prevent all infection it does prevent serious illness and hospitalization there is absolutely a benefit to being vaccinated and there is absolutely a benefit to getting your boosters like, and it's undeniable, unless you're a doctor that doesn't like evidence. <laughs> okay, second to last question. Mm -hmm. How did it make you feel to have people point blank deny that? And how did it affect your relationships with people? You must have friends who denied it. Oh, well, okay, so yeah, um, my brothers and my dad, pretty much most of my family, are not vaccinated and they have some pretty strong beliefs so this has really challenged me to get to the core of what does that mean to me and what does that mean about our relationship and the reality is that my relationship with people means more to me than being right um, I can accept that people have their own point of view and that they're entitled to that point of view and that I love them anyway. You know, my dad sent me a text the other day and it said, well, 
do you still love your dear old dad enough to come and help him with his taxes? And the answer is absolutely and always. You know, we can find common ground. We can talk about yeah. other things. We can still protect each other and, and we can still be happy for our successes and all of those things without having to, to crucify each other on whether or not we're vaccinated or believe the same things about vaccination. So, yeah. So I have one last question for you. Um, and it's something we ask everybody who comes on um, because it is crazy damn Canadians. So one of the things we always wanted to know is who do you find to be an inspiring Canadian? Uh, a lot of people don't know many Canadians except Bieber and right. Celine Dion. Um, but if you could talk to any Canadian throughout history, mm -hmm. who's the Canadian you would choose to have a conversation with? They can be living or dead. Probably Haley Wickenheiser. I don't know who that is. Now you have to tell me. Um, so she is, uh, how do I explain it? Probably one of the best athletes of all time. She um, has gone to the Olympics for hockey, so women's hockey, and also gone to the Olympics for baseball, so summer and winter Olympics, um, multiple times, Canadian women's um, hockey team and baseball teams. And then she's kind of retired her, her spot, but remains extremely um, inspirational in terms of sports and especially promoting women in sports. And then just, you know, in her spare time, she went off and became a doctor. <laughs> so yeah, she's, she's probably the most inspirational. Does she have a biography? Mm, I don't know if she does or not. Mm, we have to figure that out. We do. Yeah. Be interesting to read. Maybe that can be your next thing. Maybe, you yeah. can write the biography of Haley Wickenheiser. We yeah. can Wickenheiser. Yeah. Wickenheiser. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we had a candid and real conversation about COVID. I don't think any of your answers are going to get us in trouble. I hope not. I hope not too. But um, I really appreciate you having this conversation with me and I'm, I'm glad you did it. And you're a very well-spoken individual and a good friend of mine. And thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having me.